Um, we all know Isaac. They don't have to sit here and introduce Isaac, even though that was my responsibility. So I will go ahead and do that. But seriously, we all know. Best way to introduce Isaac is by telling stories about him. Um, you know, the first time I ever came to Helicon and heard Isaac read, he read this wonderful piece about he and his dad, and just brought tears to everybody's eyes, including mine. And one of these guys cried everything. So. Um, after that, and afterwards, I went up to Isaac and said, hey, I really enjoyed your piece today. And he said, oh, <laughs> walked away. <laughs> I said, let's see if I ever talk to him again. <laughs> but the next time I saw Isaac read, he, said, he read a poem I'm sure some of you are familiar with, and hopefully you'll read it tonight, but no pressure. That starts, hot nurse, oh, yeah. lay your healing hands upon me. And I became a fan. Because yeah. <laughs> Isaac can make art dirty and vice versa. And <laughs> it was awesome. No, seriously, Isaac has a way with imagery and metaphor, in spite of what he just did to his niece a little while ago, that uh, most writers really envy. And uh, he's exceptionally talented. And a, a, a night of his own that's long overdue. So, Isaac, wow. Us. So, I kind of broke up my poems with uh, a braided essay called Cry With Thunder. So, reading about 20 minutes of poems is going to grate on anyone's. I'm not going to say that I'm that that I could carry a room with 20 minutes of poetry. I just couldn't do it. But, for me. All right. <laughs> so I, I so it's kind of you'll notice a theme, and if it's kind of sad, it will pick up and be happy. I swear. I promise. I really do. All right. So I'm just going to jump right into it, and we'll just see how it goes. Thank you for all coming. And. First poem is titled The Rain Harp. Taunting, teasing, coy fingers over the peaks, drawing half down, the curtain will not close. The alf alpha thrashes and spirals in wind frenzy. The cottonwood dispenses seeds, dispenses upward, pleading seeds, but the rain harp passes over, leaving Calio in the dust. A little blurb about Calio. Calio is my hometown where I'm from on the Western Desert on the Pony Express Trail. And it's way in the middle of nowhere. It's on the southern end of the Bonneville South Flat. Um, they named it after a city in Peru, which I believe is properly called Cayo, but in the Western nomenclature it's Calio, and it will mention it several times while I'm reading it. Cry by Thunder, August 8, 1985. 3 a.m. The rain comes in intermittent waves as does the smell of earth and dust purify. Sometimes a brief rattle of hell, but mostly the roaring of thunder. I turn up the radio, but KOMA out of Oklahoma City hisses and snaps, muting Little Richard's jubilance, burying him under the static. Lightning strikes the trailer, and the time between the light and the billowing scream is the same. Wave after wave of neon comes through the windows and down the dark hall to our bedroom. My brother's sleeping forms appear and disappear in the thunderstorm. They are asleep and unafraid. The music cuts out. The plain 1950s stencil letters and numbers of the old radio die out in a slow green fade. The darkness lets out a breath and lights up like an arc welder. The smell of shattered stone and fused earth drifts into the room. I think about how frail the trailer roof is and try to climb under a mattress. The Silent Man. The Silent Man smiles, lips scarred by a sister's stray softball when he was six. The Silent Man is not silent, holds the chapel wrap with his testimony, weaves stories with the campfire smoke, paints with puns that makes our eyes roll tells a story of the time he left on stage at the USO show in the photo you 
can't see the woman just shimmying sequins, and my father grinning like a jack-o'-lantern, and the smile remains as he is dragged screen left by two MPs. But he is silent on the man leaning against the car in the faded turtleneck whose eyes never leaves the distance. Silent about why that grin did not leave Vietnam. Silent on the girl in the black silk who walks towards him, only her smile seen under the brim of her non -law. Silent when I ask what happened over there. Silent when the drunken neighbor brags about the gooks he killed. Silent when he flinches at that word. Silent after the story about the six-foot Texan lieutenant who lost his head to a Huey blade. Silent as the snow hits the windshield as we drive deep into January. February 14th, 1985. The call for the third visit was an unpleasant surprise for my parents. They were so annoyed at the expense of another trip, they shut the door to their bedroom before taking the call. Three days, they are not much better. The six hour drive in the gray February sky does little to help their nerves. When we reach the hospital, they question the woman at the information desk in short, wary sentences. She tells us to follow the yellow line. It will lead to neurology. I tell my parents, we are like Dorothy and the Cowardly Lion. They don't laugh. When we get there, the doctor drones on about test results. I count the ceiling tiles while opening and closing my mouth, making wet gop noises. Oh, for heck's sake, Zeke, my mother hisses. Go find a bathroom or something. When I return, my parents and the doctor speak in hushed tones. My mother pleads, red face, stripped of edifice. The doctor shakes his head. My mother crumples, all the pins knocked from her scaffolding as she cries. I am torn. I want to run to my mother to comfort her, but I am scared and want to leap into my father's arms for safety. I rush forward, but only a few steps. I see my father and stop. My dad is there. My dad is not there. There is another man with the same eyes, faith, and height of my father. But my father doesn't cry. He's mountain strong. This man's eyes are stricken his hands are quivering white fists. Is he mad at me? Then my eyes land, then his eyes land on mine. He wavers, almost falling. <clears throat> Awful sound of God. The stuttered cough of machine stops and he dies in the moments between ticks. The time of ignition is the awful sound of God. May 5th, 1985. My parents and I get into the Ford Ranger with the gray fender and bounce down Calio's main road, which is just tan-packed dirt full of ruts. We pull into the Garland's yard. Their house is, has a porch that I love because it smells of grapes and wraps all the way around. We walk rock the one, two. We, we walk straight through. In Calio, money talk is for living rooms. Sunlight bleeds dark blue through the through the lace curtains, coloring the living room's walls and floor. The old maple piano gives the room the guise of a museum. On top are brass oil lamps that reflect the various figurines. Miss Garland lets me set on the old walk rocking chair, whose long walnut runners remind me of a sled. It has large macrame cushions rolled with red roses and impregnated with the scent of lilacs. I, select, I sit politely, containing the urge to rock back and forth. My parents show the brochure. On the cover is some old guy named Jerry Lewis. He makes constipated faces. There is also a boy with him in a wheelchair. The picture is wrong. The boy is too skinny. The, his jaw doesn't set right, and his arms are like sticks. There is some kind of hose that goes into his white collar around his neck. But I know that under the collar, the hose is penetrating skin. The rumble returns to my stomach. My parents converse with the Garlands in quiet tones. Every once in a while, Mr. Garland will look at me and contemplate. He is a leather man, a tough man. He looks around me, he looks at me around a bushy, low-hanging cowboy mustache. In his eyes, quiet sorrow. After a while, he writes a check for my, to my father and signs a donation slip. He offers me a soda. I say no thanks. I have a rumble stomach. A cold, sneaky whisper enters my brain, telling me they are not collecting money for Jerry's kids. It is not for Jerry Lewis at all. 
The money is for the boy with the hose in his throat. That disjointed puppet, that boy I would become. Sunday morning. North side of King's Canyon Route 50, a semi-truck burns like a paper lantern. Aluminum sides flaking into the sky, leaving behind the trailer's red bones. Half a mile away in the radiant heat of ground zero, we stand solemn. I look up at my grandfather, his face wrapped like a man catching the glimpse of a burlesque dancer's thigh. Next to my dad stands a truck driver, nodding a corduroy hat in his hands, mumbling, chanting, Oh God, oh sweet Jesus, oh God, sweet Jesus. We watch black smoke make early night, painting the sun red like revelations. August 8th, 1985, sometime after 3 a.m. Wyatt spins on the porch. I hear claw paws circling on the plywood floor. I'm still scared, but I jump out of bed in my pajamas, stumbling towards the door. I need to save my dog. He's terrified. I open the door, prepared for the rush of small golden white fur, but the door is empty. I go to turn on the light, but remember the power is out. I look around in the almost complete darkness for a flashlight. There is a flash of blue, and I see my dog briefly. He is standing on his hind legs, his front paws on the door, the stub of his tail wags. It goes dark. Again, he barks from the void. You want to go out, I blurt. Out into the yard, the scent of wet earth and orchard grass assaults me. After the darkness of the house, the outdoors is illuminated. A lightning bolt fans out across boiling thunderheads and 14 points. My hold on the doorframe iron, my knees jelly. Wyatt dances on the flagstone landing and whimpers like a child wanting to run. His joy is infectious. My hands disentangle from the doorframe and I drag myself down the cedar steps. The grave flecked stone feels warm under my feet. A brief flurry of fat raindrops pelts me, but the drops are warm as if charged. Wyatt barks and bolts across the orchard. My legs are disconnected from my brain. I chase after him. I burst through the current hedge that marks the boundary between orchard and garden. I trip on my way out of the leafy threshold to fall prone in dark clumps of dirt that smell like earth-born limes. Thunder rolls over and my will never gives out. Then there's a golden muzzle in my face and Wyatt licks me with his large, flat tongue. I sputter and curse, swatting at him, but he darts away nimbly. I get up. He's already crossed the little gate and it heads into the expanse of field. He barks and does a spin. Come and get me, two legs, he mocks. I rush out the gate, leap the ditch, and land barefoot in the alfalfa. Wyatt's trail cuts a clear path through the wet shoots. I do not want to lose the trail, so I follow him on all fours. Just rush, just, just rush through the leafy green until the knees of my pajamas are soaked through and my nightshirt becomes nothing more than a rag. Wyatt ranges further ahead of me. I hear his warthog snorts retreating. I stand up to get my bearings and find myself deeper in the field than I thought. Our house and orchard shifts as a black outline in the wind. I see Wyatt on the western edge of the field, near an irrigation ditch with his nose to the ground, stopping once in a while to dig down with badger claws, sticking his muzzle in the upturned earth and snorting a semi-wet cloud of dust. Our chase game has been replaced by the business of hunting gophers. To my right is a copper spun hay bale abandoned from spring harvest. I take off my nightshirt. The intermittent raindrops form a brown fog. Then the sky lights up again in, a, in an azure cascade. I throw myself to the alpha alpha. The sky turns blue, followed by earth shaking rumble. Then the roar fades. I cautiously rise but trip on my pajama bottoms and fall down. I curse and pull them off. I am naked, but don't care. Damn thunder, damn lightning that sends me simpering to the ground. Seconds later, more lightning arches across the sky, but I'm too angry to budge. It's trying to corral me with fluorescent fingers, but I will have none of it. I roar back and jump up on the hay bale. The sharp straw ends bite my feet, but I don't care. I yell at the sky like an animal. Wyatt stops digging and stares at me with unblinking eyes. In my head, I turn the thunder into a whisper. My voice is greater. I howl at the rain and the lightning, at the thunder, my pounding heart, my fear, my sorrow. My boy lungs expand to take the whole world. 
down with cold eye doctors, down with cold Februaries, and parents treating me with kid gloves. No machine would be attached to me. I am boy thunder. My anger lights up the west, and my rage shakes the earth. The air flames red, and a shockwave throws me from the bell. I get up slowly and stare. Just a few feet from where I was standing is a smoking circle that smells of earth and ozone. I don't think. I grab my wet clothes and run towards the house. In my mind are headlines, stupid boy struck by lightning, or naked corpse found on hay bale, news at 11. I fly through the fence and over the garden, crash the current bushes without pause. My feet barely touch paving stone or steps as I leap them into the house. They echo only twice on the wood floor of the porch. I throw the door open and shut it with one movement and fall to the dry carpet. Feel its fibers on my naked back. My heart beats fast, but I am not scared. I feel safe. On the porch, I hear Wyatt curling up in his bed. Through the house is the sleeping breath of brothers and parents. That's the longest prose piece, guys. Sorry, long. More water. This is with poems kind of rowdy. Oh boy. <laughs> Silverback. Under my feet, though I have known nothing but cages, I know mountains. Feel thunder, the vibration of rain on broad leaves, the smell of termites underground. Sometimes I feel the mist. They slap the window, show their flat teeth. Even through three inches of glass, I smell their reek. Carbonated, sugar-infused sacks of meat. I show my teeth. Great canines bite power to puncture still. I rise up, drum my chest, roar until the room shakes. When I was five, I stood up in my tiny cage, head inches from the roof lunged against the bars. The vet in his neat, prim coat said I was spirited. If the bars had given way, I'd have shown him. I rush up the branches, hand over hand, until I am eye level. They bow their legs, shorts ballooning out, clap their hands, again show their teeth. I shake the tree, play the anchor cables like a harp, throw my lips back, cover the glass with spit. They slap the window again, laugh. They brought me a female, but like me, she has a head full of half memories. Never been the top female, never hid the troop as I foraged. I did not win her, her mother, her sister, or her aunts. I did not charge the great gray ape, throw him down, show my teeth. She was never mine, but they watch as if she were, wanting gorillas from half gorillas. I pound my chest, the bow trunk swings, Plaster falls from the ceiling. They do not step back. I launch myself against the glass, rattling the wall, and leave a smear of blood in front of their faces. As I fall 20 feet, hit cement. I hear them laugh. But before the impact, they shrink back, stinking of fear. Oh, if the glass had given way, they would have but one scream. Then I'd run into the sunlight, leaving bloody handprints. Mothers would knock over strollers. Fathers would freeze. Camera phones half up. I would show them a silverback in his prime. They would scream, bleed, die until the men came. Not the Tad clan keepers in their red hornets and sleepy nausea, but the men in blue would come in flak jackets with rifles, and they would shoot me, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. But I would not fall. I would show my teeth. Roar blood from my lungs, sea mountains. August 8, 2003, Nevada morning. My wife and I sit in our car, pulled off the road 25 miles west of Caliente on Route 95. The great thunderheads only drop their water halfway. The rain evaporates before hitting the ground. Every once in a while, cold rain penetrates the air shield with fat drops, avenging itself in microburst fury. Only in the desert does rain kick up a dust. Erin lies back against me. Her eyes track the lightning. She silently counts, and I feel her shiver against me when, e when the thunder pills. That was close, she whispers, 
as if thunderstorms are communions. I peer out through the rain-streaked glass, hold her close, and take in the scent of her clean hair. The brief storm passes, and I get out and stretch my road-weary legs. Compared to last year, I'm a little worse for wear. Can't drive as far as I wish, but 1985 is a long way gone, as are the projected death dates, 16, 21, 30. The doctors have long since clarified my diagnosis as Becker's muscular dystrophy. I don't know if my physical therapist would approve of this trip, but Aaron makes sure to mine my smaller battery. I reflect on the boy with the collar and its hose. I'm not a puppet, either was he. He was my friend Jeremy, and he lived his short life well. Some that are healthy would say I was lucky, but that not to have the type of muscular dystrophy that killed Jeremy. But, I, but they really don't have a damn clue. How lucky is it to bury a friend? I look at my wife, smile as I watch her raptured face waiting for the next show. It's the moment, it's this moment, and moments like it that carries with it an understanding, one that Jeremy knew at only 16, that we are not unlucky but fortunate. We are the few that know one free breath is worth a lifetime of worry. Will I want run free as I did when I was 10 and scream unashamed and defiant? No. But I will carry the spark as long as I can. I am Boy Thunder and I am content. I get back into the car and whisper something in Aaron's ear, making her smile. The storm starts up again and we watch the world explode in brilliance. This is the last one. <laughs> Stories to tell the five foot nine inch man. What should I, the older, shorter me, tell the five nine me, the boy really? I would say man, but I never felt like a man. Like my father. Growing up, my father seemed to be the cut, the mold of all fathers. My father baptized me, held one hand in the air, the other strong hand in the small of my back and guided me under the water and drowning never entered my mind, not once, as the water of the warm spring closed over my body laid flat. That is the first thing I would tell my five foot nine self, remember immersion. Remember a thousand liquid fingers tickling your body. Remember the gym glitter world just under the blue, the world fractured into waves but whole and clear all the same. I remember the seminary. The elder said, plain and rather blunt, that we are baptized on earth because there is no water in heaven. And I shrug my shoulders because at 17, who thinks of water? But now at 38, after not being immersed in water for two years, since I got stuck in a bathtub, thinking warm water would calm my spasming back, my wife pulls me out onto the floor, a pale, wet eel and wraps me in a towel until I drain my strength to crawl. I could tell you I was thinking of that dry heaven, now at eternal hell, but instead I remember the time two years into our marriage that we fell out of the shower onto the hotel floor, and as you turned off the lights and the casino lights shine outside the window, reflect off the mirror, I draw her, your curves onto me. Stroke your short hair, fill the length of your legs down my flanks. I would tell the five foot nine me to remember that because now I don't feel the tingle of your thighs, I can still feel the weight, but I don't feel the fabric move on the skin your kisses made with bumps rise. That is what I would tell the five foot nine me to remember. Holy water, the warmth of your body, the roundness of your knees. Thank you.